All right, good health, and welcome to today's edition of About Health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Norris. See, you know, these other programs have better music than I do. I think I'm going to have to do something. I'm going to do something about that to jazz up my introduction. Um, mojo working now. That's really something. That goes back a long way. Well, but here I am, and I'm glad to be with you this week. We're going to focus on respiratory disease this week. That means that I'm um, going to talk about asthma, maybe a little bit about lung cancer, maybe a little bit about allergies, some things about children. Uh, but most we're going to focus on asthma. You know, it's funny. Asthma was a big deal for uh, a long time over the last 10 to 12 years. But now we've seen that um, a lot of the... Um, a lot of the emphasis on asthma, uh, either both from the community aspect and from a professional aspect, seems to be waning when a lot of exciting things are happening uh, in the area of asthma and respiratory disease. And I thought to myself, well, you, I, I'm an allergist, and asthma is one of my specialties, but I want to get to someone who knows a little bit more than I do, someone who's a little bit more a contemporary, uh, one of the giants in our field. And so I have as my guest to this uh, uh, first part of our program, Dr. Leroy Green. Dr. Graham is an internationally famous pulmonologist, pediatric pulmonologist from the Atlanta area, uh, as well known for his generosity uh, to his community as he is for his professional knowledge. And he's agreed to join us um, uh, on short notice, uh, I would have to say, for for, um, a few minutes to talk about um, a lot of the things that are going on in asthma that we need to, to know about. Dr. Graham, welcome to our program. Well, Mike, thanks. It's always a pleasure. Did you like that music? I like that music. Yeah. You know, like you, I'm a jazz fan, <laughs> so, so uh, you had me at hello. Right? <laughs> Right. Good, 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 good. You know, I, I, one of the things that is kind of an enigma to me is that there's so many exciting things happening in the area of asthma, both the understanding of the disease, uh, the management, the extraneous uh, social determinants, and the treatment. Yet it seems that um, that uh, many people, un- very much like uh, other things, um, you know, that come and go, uh, have lost an interest in asthma. Uh, is it less of a problem now? Absolutely not, Mike, and I'm, I'm, I share your surprise that it is waning. Uh, we know for a fact that if you consider pediatric asthma, uh, exacerbations or flare-ups of asthma are still the number one cause that leads children to be admitted to the emergency room or the inpatient service in each and every children's hospital in the United States. We also know that uh, disparities uh, persist in that uh, children of color and Hispanic children are much more likely to suffer and be hospitalized and sadly die from asthma than their majority counterparts. So while you're absolutely right, there are some exciting things coming out. We just have not seen the benefit at ground level, and it is surprising, as you say, and that interest appears to be waning because the problem is still very, very huge. You know, one of the thing areas where we see some of the most uh, interesting dynamics is in the understanding the pathophysiology of the disease. You know, there is a tendency, I think, among my uh, primary care colleagues, and sometimes I'm a primary care colleague myself, that asthma is one disease uh, that it, you know it presents with respiratory distress and wheezing, but uh, when we talk about asthma, we have to talk about asthma from a lot of different perspectives, both genetic and phenotypic, don't we? Absolutely, and, and that is, is some of the research that's coming out now. We know the traditional thought about asthma is that this is a child that coughs and wheezes, but now we know there's exercise asthma, there's occupational asthma, uh, there's asthma that clearly is seasonal in terms of allergies and seasonal in terms of exposures to pollution, as, as has been so clearly demonstrated in California. I, I think what is also very interesting now is that some of the new emerging therapies as you say, really dictate that we understand the phenotype or the clinical distinctions in these patterns of asthma to appropriately apply these therapies. So while it's very, very exciting, I think there's still much work to be done so that these new and novel and exciting therapies are appropriately appropriately applied to the segments of the asthma population that need them. Yeah, we used to think about asthma as a disease relating to a particular couple. I remember when I first started in practice, we talked about asthma being a result of a couple of chemicals, histamine and something called slow-reacting substance of anaphylaxis. Uh, Do you remember that that's one? That's RSA. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's RSA. You're dating yourself. Right, I understand. I understand. I understand. I'm trying to. Experience means something. Uh, and so that they, uh, they now we know that, oh, oh, man, a chemical a week comes out in every journal. What 
what are some of the more important chemicals? And are, are we at the point now where we can use our new expanded knowledge of not only these chemicals but these calcium receptor things? Uh, are we at the point where the patient and the person can start to benefit from our increased knowledge about yes. asthma? I think we're just beginning, but the hard reality is that many of these things, particularly the calcium channel blockers, selective calcium channel blockers and the like, are still probably a ways away from clinical application and, again, may treat uh, very defined segments. So I think while there's hope, what I think, and I think you probably agree with me, is we need to apply some of the therapy that we already have at hand. And, again, we suffer, as you have so eloquently talked about, that people often see asthma as an episodic problem process where you give a reliever like albuterol and they don't appreciate that in all of these various uh, mediations, if you will, the underlying problem is still an inflamed airway. And while there's new and exciting ways to treat it, we're underutilizing some of the basic treatment that would probably treat a lot of the asthma that seems to be poorly controlled at the present. Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting dynamic. You know, when let's let's kind of review uh, with our audience, and let me remind them we're talking to Dr. Leroy Grammy, a pediatric uh, pulmonologist, an expert in both adult and pediatric asthma. We're talking about uh, asthma as a, a clinical condition. If you got a question about asthma, eight four eight four four two five or one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight or questions uh, um, uh, for Dr. Graham, we will certainly uh, entertain. Uh, uh, as many as we have the opportunity uh, to do. Let's go back to some of these misconceptions about asthma. I mean, I, I, I'm just still always um, surprised that people still think about asthma as an, as an acceptable, I mean, as a as a disease of no consequence. Let's start with that one. That means you can have a little asthma and then it goes away, and you can have a little more and it goes away, and as long as you don't uh, do anything, you won't die. Well, that's as you know, not true, but unfortunately, a lot of people, and sometimes some of our policymakers, some of our educators, some of our corporate people do have that misconception that a little asthma, I'd say a little asthma is kind of like a little pregnant. You know, it doesn't really fit the bill. So, so what happens a lot of times is because asthma is episodic in nature, people say that sometimes, you know, maybe we really don't need to be aggressive because sometimes asthma will appear to resolve on an episodic basis on its own. But the hard reality of it is those, those recurrent episodes often come at a cost that may lead to missing school or work, a trip to the emergency room, a hospitalization. And sadly, we still have to realize that in this country, we still have quite a few people every year that die of asthma. So it, it's not something that we can, can, can I pass off as, you know, just a passing thing. And the problem I have, and as you know, Mike, my passion is to really educate the public to be an informed consumer. And people have to see this. We do a lot of community-based programs here, and I'm amazed at middle-aged people who are standing in front of me at screening programs we do where I've documented they still have abnormal lung function, might even be audibly wheezing or having difficulty breathing as they stand in front of me, and they'll say sometimes, oh, I have a little bit of the asthma, but it's gone away. No, it hasn't gone away, and these people have modified their lifestyles. They've taken lesser jobs in many cases. Uh, their social lives are impaired, and sometimes their health is at risk because of the misconception that they've even kind of inculcated into themselves. So I think we have to kind of re-educate ourselves that asthma probably does require a partnership between the primary care and the specialist to characterize that asthma, even with the, with the new knowledge we have, and to really pick the appropriate treatment. Now, certainly there is some asthma that maybe people that only have asthma would exercise, though in pediatrics we find that a lot of those actually do have chronic asthma. There may be people that have occupational asthma where there's something in their environment, their work environment, that can be modified. Okay, but... The reality is that all of these forms of asthma need to be characterized, and most, if not all, need to be treated somehow. What about the notion, then, and I you know, know where it stands now, that prolonged asthma can actually result in, uh, in ultimate damage to the airway that makes it sometimes indistinguishable from chronic obstructive lung disease like emphysema? Excellent point. In fact, there is so much. So first off, you brought up COPD, and it's important to realize that COPD, by the end of this decade, if not sooner, will be the third most prolific killer in the United States behind cancer and heart disease. And what is really interesting now about COPD is just what you talk about. There is now something called the overlap syndrome. These are people rising into adulthood who did not smoke but have the physiologic and clinical features of COPD. 
And what we're concerned about is... No, no, let me stop and say, tell people what COPD is, chronic obstructive, obstructive pulmonary disease, often called emphysema, but go ahead. Yes, so, so what we're now finding is that many of these patients, when we look back, who have now developed this pattern of COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, or chronic bronchitis, actually when you go back, you find that they never smoked, okay? Didn't have significant passive smoking exposure, but many of them had asthma that, quote, had gone away. And so you look at them and they now have significant obstruction in their lung function, poorly responsive to therapy, which is characteristic of traditional COPD. Now, the interesting thing is we wonder in some of these patients if that inflammation that was unchecked for so long caused structural changes in the airway, scarring, as it were, that now leaves those people looking like someone who had 30 years of smoking and predictably had deterioration of their lung function. And the exciting thing is that if, as we get more and more people to realize this, then the idea that asthma is just going to go away and there's no cost of maybe not going too hard on the treatment may be, may be something that we need to change. Because I'm now seeing this in, in older patients, but now that I'm working with adults, I see this quite at least one, one patient a clinic I see. But no, Doc, I, I never did smoke, um, but, but your lung function looks like this. No, I, I have a lot of t trouble with exercise, and yeah, I do have a kind of a bad cough, and sometimes I bring stuff up. All features that heretofore were thought, well, that's somebody that smoked and then developed this COPD, chronic bronchitis, and emphysema. But in point of fact, there may be a population of people with asthma or children with asthma who are not appropriately treated. And as they grow into adulthood, and we know our lungs get stiffer just normally, that aging process collides with the scarring that may have developed and leaves these people severely incapacitated in some cases. Our special guest, Dr. Leroy Graham, he's a pediatric pulmonologist, an expert in adult and pediatric asthma. So we're going to be talking with him about asthma, of course, as long as it takes to get an understanding of disease and to talk about the special programs that He's initiated uh, not only in the Atlanta area but around the country. So 848-4425 is our number in the 510 area code. 1-800-958-9008 is our 800 number. If you want to ask questions about asthma, then uh, give us a call. There's an open line. Uh, let's go to Robert in San Mateo. You're on About Health. Yes, uh, thanks for your program, Dr. Lenore. And uh, I have a, a brief story and a question about it. My wife, uh, she has uh, when I first met her, had asthma and we always had the inhalers available and would use them occasionally when she'd have a stressful day or a problem. Uh, we moved out of a house that we lived in for several years where uh, the last few years her asthma got worse and worse and worse where the inhalers really didn't work anymore and uh, she was getting desperate. When we moved out of the house, her problem completely ceased. Huh. And the only clue I have is that there was some mold under the house. There was uh, moisture that would get under the house whenever it would rain, and then never really dry out. And I remember just before we left finding this, you know, growth of all different colors of mold, you know, green, black, white, every color was completely covering the, the ground just uh, a foot or so under the house. Wow. So I, and there were carpets in the house, but... Other than that, the, the place we moved into had wood floors and steam heat rather than forced air heat. And her, her symptoms completely disappeared, and it's been several years. So the question I have is, you know, it's magical, the result, but, like, I would love to be able to help others I know that have asthma find, you know, what might be in their environment. If that's really the case with her, is it is it possible she just grew out of it, or what? You know, what do you think, Dr. Grant? Yeah, well, I'll tell you that that is a not uncommon story, and she had asthma, but it seems that she had an environmental trigger that she was exposed to with the mold, the blooming mold that, you know, we don't see it bloom, but mold is a plant and spores develop and patients are sometimes allergic or just the amount of mold may be irritating to them even if they aren't allergic. And when you moved out of that house in that environment, she lost that trigger that caused her asthma to be unstable. 
and and kudos to you for doing that uh, it's only serendipitously but i'll tell you one of the things that i counsel a lot of patients to is when they're being treated with asthma and the asthma remains unstable they're doing all the things the doctor asks then we should think about the environment and we should think about allergies as my colleague mike has, has spent a career doing so you know it's not all medicines and i hope i didn't give you that impression but it's also looking at what might be environmental factors and and in aging i don't know how old the your original home was, but sometimes in older homes, what collects in the uh, air ducts and so forth can be quite inflammatory and quite irritating. So a lot of times when I find myself scratching my head, you know, and probably Dr. Lenore would say I should think of it sooner because of his allergy perspective, (laughs) I often kind of check myself and say, have I asked all the pertinent questions about the environment? And what you did for the listeners is you described exactly what we want people to observe, the the colorful mold you saw, the collection of moisture and so forth, that should be a red flag about mold. And, and mold can be harmful to people even without asthma in a lot of different ways. So, you know, I thank you for a very coherent example of where an environmental factor caused destabilization of her asthma. And absent that, her asthma is doing quite well without treatment. That is quite possible. Yeah, I think that you'll find it in many instances, especially in children, that they're, you know, when you start talking about how you manage a chronic problem like asthma, understanding what triggers it is so critically important. And often allergens and irritants may be the main uh, feature. We, we see most Absolutely. often in these very serious illnesses is it high, something simple as house dust, and certainly you got a cat. Now that's just a, that's kind of the worst. <laughs> and, and I'm not going to get into to do deeply with the animal, <laughs> but certainly uh, if you have animals, guinea pigs, cats, dogs, a lot of those things can trigger the asthma. So thanks for that. Well, before we leave the area of smoking, uh, doctor, um, what about the um, the issue? I only smoke outside. Ah, oh, that's great. Well, I have parents tell me that all the time. And I, a quick anecdote, when I was in the military, I had to go up and make uh, consultant trips to Minot, North Dakota, where it frequently got to 50 degrees below zero. And I'll, I'll never forget the child that came in smelling like an ashtray. And the mother, I asked her about smoking. She said, Doctor, I only smoke outside and only at night. So that taught me a couple of things. Most parents would say that aren't telling the truth. They, they don't want to, you know, admit to being guilty of that. But more importantly, even if they were smoking outside, the particles, there, there are particulates that come out of the burning in the smoke. You know, the fact that so many people smoke filtered cigarettes, there's been some studies that have shown that there is more irritants and perhaps even more carcinogens coming out the burning end of a, of a cigarette, uh, cancer-causing molecules and so forth. So... It gets in your skin, it gets in your hair, and the child, you know, especially if it's a child who's clinging to his mother, playing with his dad, gets exposed to that over and over again. And I would really give parents kind of the what for, but I'd say, you know, if you really can't quit smoking, and I appreciate that hard in the near term, then you need to kind of come in, change your clothes, and take a shower before you play with your child, which most people kind of recoil that. But the smoking only outside just doesn't do it. Uh, basically, if you're going to be in close contact with someone with asthma, a loved one, or somewhere you're going to have, you know, fairly proximal contact, then you're going to bring that smoking outside and some of the particulates in on you, in your hair, your skin, and your clothes. Yeah, and there's there are several studies, uh, actually a recent study from Cincinnati that shows that um, uh, those children exposed to secondhand smoke uh, are readmitted to the hospital more often Absolutely. than kids who are, who are not Absolutely. in that. So that's I smoke outside is not going to get it. 848-4425-1-800-958-9008. Realizing that About Health is about the only program where you can talk directly to the experts, so take advantage of that, 848 848- Four four two five in the five one zero area code and one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. Let's talk to Lois in Oakland. You're on about health. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for coming on the program, Doctor Graham. And I want to know what I can do to improve my lung function. I'm sixty nine years old. Never had asthma. Never smoked. Had bronchitis three times in a row six years ago and have never recovered my lung function. What doctors have told me and all the drugs they've given me uh, keep me up till 4 a.m. in the morning. And what doctors have told me is that I can't recover lung function. And my latest diagnosis is asthmatic bronchitis. And 
I think I should be able to recover some lung function, um, particularly given that I was never a smoker, never lived with smokers, mm -hmm. never had asthma. Well, we know that sometimes serious respiratory infections or just particularly virulent respiratory infections can alter lung function and can do damage. Um, I would, I'm a little kind of um, at odds with the diagnosis of asthmatic bronchitis. You know, I, I might suggest, and I don't know who you're being seen, you might get a second opinion on that and really decide if there are other therapies they could try. But what you ask is what you can do. And I'll give you the example of my mother. My mother is 83 years old now. She's real, still real feisty and so forth. She did smoke and did have pretty bad lung function. And while that's not the same as you, she was told in her early 60s, not much we can do. Well, I got her another second opinion, and she was put in what was called a pulmonary rehab program, which basically got her better fit with the lung function she had. She started working on the treadmill and so forth. They taught her some breathing exercises. Didn't necessarily improve her lung function numbers, but improved her capacity to exercise. And in her case, she had a slight oxygen requirement, which she got off of through this pulmonary rehab. And pulmonary rehab is something that, um, as a pediatric pulmonologist, I wasn't really aware of, but it's become a mainstay in treating adults who often do have irreversible changes in lung function to improve their quality of life and their ability to exercise. So I, I would strongly suggest that you maybe take that to your doctors, ask them about pulmonary rehab, and, and again, it far be it for me to criticize a doctor where I don't see any charts or anything, but I'm a little troubled by that diagnosis of asthmatic bronchitis. I, I might really push them, well, what do you mean by asthmatic bronchitis? Because it tends to be a term kind of, of several years ago, and we've, we've kind of moved on and tried to be a little bit more specific, and I certainly can't give you a diagnosis over the phone, but but the, the pulmonary rehab programs, I would really inquire about that because my mom just she blew me away. I mean, what she, I was really worried about her. She had gotten on a little oxygen. She got off the oxygen, and bless her heart, she's got a little treadmill down in the basement, <laughs> and she gets on it every day, and she's doing well. All right, well Great. All right, thank you very much for that question. Thank well, you. Lois, yeah. Let me ask you a, a, a question. You know, one of the things that when people discuss uh, asthma, they're always talking about the, the causes in terms of allergies and exposure. And talk, talk a little bit about, because um, every week I read in journals that are not respiratory journals about some of the social determinants of asthma, those things that really increase the incidence of the disease and also um, make, make for um, um, outcomes that are not equitable in certain communities. Absolutely. I think some of that is uh, the social determinants, poverty, living in a violent environment, living in maybe an environment where you may be closer to industrial sources than people living in a, with a higher uh, uh, higher standard of living and so forth. But what we know, for instance, and as you know, there's some eloquent studies out of the Inglewood district in Chicago, which is a, a, a district that sadly is still, still, um, in the vex of violence and people living in violent cultures where our, our nervous system has a fight and flight reaction. They've shown that these children, almost regardless of therapy, have worse asthma. We also know that access to care is a, is a huge thing. We know that many times in certain inner cities, and, and I commend your practice in Oakland because you go out of your way as a specialist to make yourself accessible to all patients, but we know that economic realities, even post-Obamacare, many children who are impoverished do not get to see specialists and not get standards of care. We also know that there is some evidence and that there may be some genetic predispositions behind this and that particularly African-American children and maybe Latino children, particularly those of Puerto Rican ancestry that have emigrated to the Middle Atlantic or the Northeast, may have asthma that is just genetically worse. We have not nailed the gene down, but several studies suggest that. We also know that they may be more susceptible to allergic mediation. So a lot of these social and ethnic determinants, I think, have been poorly studied. And oftentimes medicine, as you know, will say, well, they're just dysfunctional. You know, and it's not that. I think there clearly are social determinants. Also, you know, 
parents, and this this also comes out of Inglewood, where parents were criticized about maybe not getting their children into care, and the, the mothers would say, I'm trying to keep this child alive. So, you know, I, I'm trying to keep two jobs. I'm trying to keep a job. So there's a lot of factors like that. Um, also, I think poverty, many people much smarter than me look at poverty as having an imprint on a whole wide range of diseases for a multitude of factors, not all of which are purely economic. And uh, just what, the what challenge of trying to live in that kind of environment and survive. A survival mode is turned on different things in the nervous system that may, uh, as you talked earlier in the program, may have something to do with the, the physiology or the underpinning of the asthma because of the environment, the, the, the traumatic environment many of these people live in. Um, so I think all of those social determinants play a role, and I think they're increasingly understood, but sadly sometimes ignored. Yeah, you know, in point of fact, uh, there was an article uh, last week published. Um, I can't remember whether, what what the exact reference was. Is is that African American children are four times more likely to be in poverty, uh, and so a lot of these chronic diseases, especially uh, asthma, being probably the number one chronic disease uh, in children in, in these communities, um, may just simply result from that. Eight four eight four four two five one eight hundred nine five eight nine zero zero eight. We got an interest here, Doctor Graham. Let's go to Ingrid in Oakland. You're about health. Um, hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Absolutely. I wasn't sure. Great. Thank you so much for this program. Um, I'm excited and you've already answered a number of the questions I had. I was diagnosed, I guess, with asthma when I, I'm 64 now, when I had puberty, which was a little early I had, and uh, then at Kaiser, and then was put on steroids, uh, inhaled steroids, and later... I, I just wanted to get off of those and, and started to understand my triggers, took myself off, had a couple of attacks some years later, went back, and then they told me, no, I don't have asthma, with no explanation. I said, what then do I have? And I think it might have been because I was um, on my bike and had a large lung capacity, possibly. But... Um, but my triggers, I just stay away from them. I don't take medication, and and um, and I just I, I think I'm I'm just calling here. So I want to make a, a point of how perfumes that are in laundry detergents and people wear like colognes and all, and cigarette smoke even from across the street uh, can can actually affect people with asthma. And I wanted that sort of just to get out there. <laughs> Well, you're, you're absolutely correct. And in your own case, you know, I, I told parents, I used to tell parents of children who were maybe deconditioned. I said that, you know, getting in good shape may not make the asthma go away, but frequently it decreased the therapeutic burden. It didn't take as much medicine to control. And it kind of goes back to the anecdote that I told about my mother and that the, the, the caller, the previous caller kind of, um, identified. Um, one of the things also to remember is that in mild cases of asthma, when you're asymptomatic, you, you can and in fact should have normal lung function. So sometimes what we tell people is that having normal lung function or being asymptomatic at the time you're in a doctor's office does not, does not release the potential of a diagnosis of asthma. And that's why a good history is so important. But I think in your case, I think you, you did a couple of good things, uh, in terms of identifying the things that were triggers, avoiding them. Right. And then it sounds like you went after getting yourself in shape and that helps. Well, I was in better shape before actually and, and still got the asthma. I think it was much like a call, a previous caller. I, there was mold, uh, or, water mm-hmm. under the house, under the bedroom and only when i moved out did i or or little prior to that i suppose did realized it was beneath the linoleum and the floor mm-hmm. and that was because wow. water so there was mold there all along and also i had an old car an old volvo that that and and i think there's the seat the old uh um the foam can also trigger uh-huh. that i think yeah, and those are all all definite possibilities. How are you doing now? Old cigarettes, perfumes, laundry products, and all that dust and diesel fumes. Uh, I, I could I could go on my bike behind a car, and, but if it was smoking with the window open, then I would get sick, <laughs> unless it was diesel. But uh, so it, I still have symptoms, and I pretty much cough every day for some reason or other. But I just mm-hmm. try to. Stay away from whatever triggers, because the longer I'm exposed to it, the longer I'll, uh, my lungs will 
well up and, and swell up and then I get the mucus and all that. But right. the shorter exposure I have, the, then it goes away, you know, and I'm okay. Yeah. Now. Oh, well, thank you very well, much that's good. for sharing that with us, Ingrid. Thank you. All right, well, let's... thank you. Thank you for the program. It's, it's, it's great. <laughs> all right, let, let's go to Los Angeles and talk to Gerardo. You're on About Health. Hi, this is a uh, first time uh, caller. Uh, thank you for uh, receiving my call. I'm just shocked about uh, Cuba. Uh, either people don't want to talk about uh, what problems the people have who live in Cuba. I've been going over there for almost 15 years. Uh, I just heard Amy Goodman has been there in the past. But, you know, Gerardo, you got the wrong program, brother. That this is a health program. So uh, if you've got a health problem, we'd love to hear uh, any problem that you have. But right now, uh, you, this is not a, a program about uh, geography or politics. It's really a program about health. So thank you for taking the time to call, and I hope that you uh, call us again if you've got a health problem when we're on the air. The program is called About Health. Our number, 848-4425, and the 510 area code, 1-800-958-9008 is our 800 number. And we've got a couple open lines. So if you've got a question about asthma, our special guest, Dr. Leroy Graham from the Atlanta area, an internationally famous pulmonologist and expert in adult and pediatric asthma. This is a real opportunity for those of you who are struggling or fighting or working or the Theorizing about the disease to talk uh, to one of the world's experts uh, in the problem. Let's go to Redwood City and talk to uh, Bill. Is it Bill? Bill in Redwood City. Bill is gone. All right, let's talk to Chris then. Chris? Yes. You're on about health almost immediately. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> uh, um, I I was calling because I was, I'm 66 now, but at around 64, I think, I was diagnosed, and to me, out of the blue with asthma. And I felt kind of stupid because I'm a nurse, and I had been coughing every spring, for years, and you know, people would say, "Oh my God, did you get your TB test?" And yeah, I got my TB test. It's negative. Yada yada yada. But I just assumed it was allergies and blew it off. And then one year, uh, the community garden had a whole bunch of tree chips delivered, and I spent about four days moving them into the garden, and they were moldy. And by the end of the time, I was feeling kind of tired, but I didn't really figure out any kind of, kind of connection. And it was in the middle of the week when I was walking across the floor and I suddenly realized I could hear myself wheezing. And I, I just hadn't put it together. I called my doctor and he could hear it over the phone and he said, you got three choices. I call the uh, paramedics and take you in now. You go immediately to the pharmacy and you take the steroids as I prescribe and this and that and you're going to go see an allergist. I mean, he gave me this whole line of stuff because he knows, you know, nurses were terrible patients. You know, we always think we know. I can only the doctors. <laughs> you know, and I, I now, and I tried to get the allergy shots. It turned out when they did the allergy testing, uh, I was allergic to some sort of airborne mold that's really common. Uh -huh. And I live out in the Redwoods, so it's not like the Redwoods are going to stop being moldy anytime soon. And <laughs> he put me, uh, I couldn't take the shots because I had a severe reaction to the shots to desensitize you. So he put me on this. Um, generic Allegra, which I can get at Costco. Um, and the symptoms, I mean, I'm, I, I cough a little bit in the morning, and I, when, once that stuff kicks in, I'm fine. But it's, it's the craziest thing. What do you think, Dr. Graham? Well, I'm, I'm going to partly defer to you, but I, it sounds like you obviously were exposed to something, and you probably did have underlying asthma, and, and you did respond. But I was going to ask uh, Dr. Lenore, who is an allergist, what he thinks about this in an adult like this with some exposures and, you know, whether or not this was something new or this was something latent that became unmasked. 
You know, it's probably something late that became unmasked. Most of the time, she's in the same environment for quite some time. But, uh, but you know, it, it does take some investigation at the time. I think before people make decisions about medication and direction they're going to take, that these p potential triggers need to be looked at. Because now you're, you're kind of rolling along pretty well, and so to go back and try to get the detail is going to be a little bit more challenging. But I, I do, do think it brings up the point that when you have a disease like asthma, the triggers are so critically important, uh, and that you try to sit down with your primary care doc or some expert uh, in the whole e uh, issue of triggers and try to identify those things around you because what we all would like to avoid is long-term use of medication unless it's absolutely necessary. But thanks right. for sharing that with us, uh, Chris. We appreciate that. Uh, now let's go to Vallejo and talk. Let's go to um, North Bay and talk to John. John, you're on about health. John? Marvin. Oh, oh, is it Marvin? I'm sorry. I was looking at the wrong arrow. Marvin, you're on about health. I can't. Can you hear it? No, I can't. There's I can't, a little bit no, of a voice. No, 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 I can't. can't. Yeah, well, okay, well, let's try John and come. Hmm. Let's... It's real muffled. Yeah, turn your radio down then. Now, John, can you hear us? Marvin? Can you hear me? I can hear John, but I couldn't hear yeah. Marvin. Marvin, if you'll call back, we'd appreciate it. Okay, John, oh, you're, okay. you're on about health. Okay. Is that me now? It's you now. Okay. I was watching a program on uh, on PBS yesterday about uh, medical marijuana, and they mentioned that uh, it's been shown that uh, smoking marijuana actually can help relieve uh bronchial congestion uh, that's due to asthma. And I wonder, how does that work? I mean, you would think it's counterintuitive, smoke uh, and like that. You wouldn't think it would do that. So do you have an answer? Uh, I don't. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't have an answer, but I can tell you this. Um, there is some evidence that certain alkaloids, these are the chemicals in marijuana, might have bronchodilation properties. However, that means they open up. You're that means, them. That means that they open up airways. Right. Well, I'm sorry, opening up your airway. But if you're getting that through inhaling a superheated gas that still has incompletely combusted particles, it, it's it's kind of hard to fathom. Now, I've had patients. Uh, I took care of a lot of adolescents and now some adults that have come in and asked me, and I said, Well, here's the way I look at that. If one end of it is burning, the other end shouldn't be in your mouth. Now, having said that, there's a lot of research now going on to marijuana. We're finding there are a lot of medicinal, medicinal properties. But a lot of those are, in some cases, best delivered by vaporizers or by the oils in a different form. Cookies. So I, I guess I'd have to admit, I don't know enough about actually smoking it and delivering it where I can be convinced that it outweighs the the harmful effects of just having something that you're burning and inhaling in your lungs. But I have to admit that there is more and more research with legalization and, and, and decriminalization across the country. There is more and more research showing that the hemp plant does have a lot of medicinal properties. But I have to stop short based on my reading. I can't really advocate delivering that by smoking because yeah. I, it's just I've, I've seen too many people and way way back in my ancient history i remember people coughing their heads off so it's kind of hard for me to 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 really fathom that but i do think that there are some beneficial compounds uh in marijuana okay that could help a wide variety of diseases but i think we still need to learn more and i just i just and maybe dr lauren might have more well I, I go I back to advocate actually smoking yeah i go all the way back to 1984 there's an article in the new england journal that showed that marijuana had some bronchodilator properties but i think it was delivered in a, in a different fashion i kind of agree with yeah. you about smoke of any type uh, it has a tendency to irritate even especially if your asthma is not well controlled Let, let's go in now and talk to bill in redwood city you're on about health yes uh you can hear me we can uh, yes uh -huh. oh, thank you yes um so i had i'm 75 i had asthma in my childhood both my parents smoked quite a bit and then uh it, it kind of went away and uh then i had bronchitis in my 40s and i was doing some smoking then now i quit you know 30, 40 years 30 years ago and uh now i'm being treated for apnea and 
uh, apnea is a, as, as you know, the pulmonary problem. I was wondering, is there any relationship uh, that you have discovered or look for between apnea and early uh, early on asthma? Well, there, there is some data, and, and again, I encourage my colleague, uh, Dr. Lenore, to, to chime in as well. There is some evidence that patients, and this is pediatric data, but I think I've read a recent adult uh, that patients that develop sleep apnea, okay, is sometimes more common in patients who have asthma or other obstructive lung diseases. And that may be because what happens is in many of those cases, you wind up breathing at what we call very low lung volumes. So anything that has you at a low lung volume, you lose your reserve. And many of those patients with sleep-associated changes in breathing do seem to have more apnea. Now, that that is a possibility. And I wonder with your history of smoking, then stopping, then smoking, then stopping, and, and now later in life, as we know the lung ages and gets stiffer, you know, I think that may play a role. I would certainly encourage you, obviously, not to smoke anymore. Sounds like you quit that 30 years ago. But I'd also encourage you to maybe have your primary care doctor either themselves obtain some lung function on you, find out what your lung volumes are, find out what the flows are, because you might, even though you don't have the typical symptoms you had before, you still might have some physiologic obstruction, and treating that may be a useful adjunct to dealing with your apnea, because there have been studies to show that apnea is increased in younger patients with uh, asthma and in older patients with asthma and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. All right, well, thanks very much. Uh, have we already talked to Marvin, or is Marvin on the phone now? Welcome, Marvin, I'm sorry to make you wait so long. Uh, thank you for calling. You're on About Health. Yeah, quickly, I have, I have a, a suggestion, the power of the mind. My son had asthma, and um, we threw out the moldy rugs. He recovered. He still had mild asthma, and then as we moved to Santa Cruz, he said, I don't have asthma, I don't have asthma, I don't have <laughs> asthma. It went away. Okay, so I think the power of mind is very important, the placebo, the placebo effect, if you will. And I'm wondering if meditation would help the people who are living in stressful, violent poverty situations. Thank you. Oh, yeah. That's an excellent question. And certainly we do know that even though I don't think asthma is just a, a, a mind disease, we know that emotional states, as we described, can be triggers, can mitigate, you know, how bad the asthma is. So I would say that you have to combine kind of what you said with some objective measurement of lung function. So in your child, felt maybe he did get to the point where his asthma no longer required therapy, and that's a good thing. But I always caution patients when that happens to go see their doctor and document that their lung function is good because I've had some children who have come in just proudly saying, hey, doc, you know, my asthma is a whole lot better now. I haven't had an attack in forever, and uh, so I'm going to stop all my medicines. And I said, okay, let's stop them, but then after you've been off them, let me see what your lung function is. And I've seen lung function drop. And there's a lot of evidence that if your lung function falls, at some point, if you don't bring it back up, you're going to have an asthma problem. So where I, I think your son may be absolutely right, that his asthma may have gone away or at least gotten, uh, you know, clinically quiescent, I think it would be very wise to just have someone check his lung function. Because I've seen kids and adults slide down this slippery slope based on just the perception that it's gone away. And, and understand, all of us, and I'm sure Dr. Lenore agrees, if my patient clearly no longer needs to be on medicine, I want to be the first one to help him take it off, okay? But I want to make that decision and have that decision informed by objective evidence. All right, 8484 425 one 800 We have a couple of open lines if you want to join us. We're talking with Dr. Leroy Graham, pulmonologist and expert in adult and pediatric uh, asthma. So 848-4425-1-800-958-9008 is our toll-free number. Uh, Dr. Graham, I think one of the things that um, we would be remiss is if we didn't ask you about um, how you've exercised uh, in a unique way um, uh, your commitment to the communities with regard to asthma. Tell us about Not One More Life. Well, now what my life is a, uh, um, thank you so much for asking, is a 501c3 not-for-profit that I 
uh, founded about 12 years ago in the memory of uh, Kellen Bolden, a young patient of mine who died of asthma. And and what I was struck by is Kellen um, had probably the worst asthma I'd ever seen, but Kellen did pretty good, not because of my expertise, but because everyone around him, his family, his school, his church, really understood his asthma, and he had people watching him like a hawk. Family did a little bit better. They moved out to suburban Atlanta, and I, the Lung Association, and other partners, maybe we didn't do as good a job as educating them. Kellen went to school one day, took a treatment because he often did that. This was in the early 90s. Um, took a treatment and uh, went on his merry way. But at the end of the day, he was waiting for the school bus, collapsed, and died. And as often as the case, there was more to the story. And what was more to the story was the, the children, the observations, the kid that loved to go outside for recess, didn't want to go out, a kid that used to always want to do pee, didn't want to do pee, a kid that was a chatterbox, so much so that his, they'd often put his smart kid, put his desk in the corner so he wouldn't disturb other kids, didn't talk. And then finally, this little boy sitting next to him said, I don't know what was wrong with that little boy, but he breathed funny all day long. All things that I believe that in his prior informed and community educated environment would have made a difference. So we got Not One More Life and developed it to go partner with communities of faith, schools, and other validated community organizations to go out and educate people, primarily children, but also adults, about asthma and other chronic lung diseases, okay? And also bring objective measurement of lung function into the community setting. And I can't tell you how much over the last 12 years, screening over 10,000 people here in Atlanta, uh, at least taking our program to 19 other cities, we, I think, have made a real impression that it's not all about medicine. It's about knowledge, and it's about empowerment. And that's what Not One Life has done, and that, that's the legacy that Kellen has left us. And I just think that sometimes we as physicians, and I think I was guilty of this, we really see what we do as confined between the walls of our exam room and office. And in reality, if we want to really change health on a population basis, we got to go out to where the people are. And we picked communities of faith and schools and other community partners because they already had a trust relationship. And I figured that if we could partner with them and have people come into a church recreation hall or a school gymnasium and let us do lung functions on them for free and educate them, we've gotten testimonies, just incredible testimonies, of how it changed lives because people just as many of the callers are, heard something, recognized something, took it back to a loved one or a friend, and somebody got better. And I think the best health care reform, and I'm I'm a fan of the Affordable Care Act to be sure, but one of the best health care reforms are making people informed and empowered participants in their own health care to achieve and to sustain health. All right. Uh, thank you very much for that. And uh, that program, I participated in it. I think many of my colleagues have. We understand the significance of that and wish it were more widely spread across the country uh, with that kind of commitment. All right, let's go talk to Julia and San Mateo. You're on About Health. Am I doing that right? Or is it? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm looking at the wrong arrow. Beth, Beth in Oakland, you're on About Health. Um, hi, I, I just want to uh, underscore what the doctor just said about uh, lung function tests because it really is a reality check to tell you what really is going on. In my case, I, I've had asthma since I was 16, and um, and I would just kind of go on and off my medication, you know. Um, but I had a number of incidences where I went where I had to go to the emergency room. But I think I was basically in denial. You know, because when you have a have an incident and it, it's really scary, um, you get scared. But um, but then when you feel normal again, you think you're okay, and you think, oh, I don't really need this. And that's what I was doing. I was going on and off my medications, and uh, and then I had a, a, a life threatening asthma attack um, about 15 years ago, and um, in which I almost died, and I was in a coma for three days, and. Um, and when I came out of that, one of the things that was so striking was that they told me that at this hospital that saved my life, they said that there was an emergency room doctor that had actually died the week before I got there from an asthma attack. <laughs> you know, a doctor had died of it. And um, and so uh, and so I was really concerned. And I thought, okay, my life, I'll never have a normal life again and so on. And, and the doctor told me, um, he said, yes, you will. You just need to have the right uh, the right medication mix and take it religiously and you should be able to be okay. And he was, um, he was really right. He, I, 
I haven't had a, um, a serious attack since that time, except for a couple of times where I, when I got a bad flu, and um, you know, and really had some some deep congestion and problems. Um, but um, but also then uh, when I went to um, a few years ago, I went to my pulmonologist because I really got religion about the medication. I knew that it was <laughs> saving my life. Hello, I knew that it was saving my life. And um, and so I, um, uh, but but she she told me that I had emphysema, and I said I I I thought I only had asthma. So now you're telling me I have emphysema, and she said, well, when you have a lot of attacks over the years, it can damage your lungs. And they used to think that uh, asthma you just bounce back from an asthma attack, but now they think that um, actually each time you get damaged. So it really, if you if you find out that you have um, uh, reduced lung capacity the way I did. I think it's really important to um, to um, understand that um, you know that you got to take that medication, and each time you have a serious attack, it can damage your lungs. All right, so good. Yeah, you want to comment on that, Doctor Garn? I think that's an excellent point, and I think coming from a patient with experience, that adds impact to it. We do think that chronic asthma, if not well controlled uh, can do damage to the lungs and I don't know all the specifics of your care but um, you know it, it sounds like you know aggressive therapy did improve you but that there might have been some harmful effect now one of the things that we do and the, the, there's something called the national guidelines for the diagnosis and management of asthma and they talk about risk and the risk that everybody thinks of is going to the emergency room and getting hospitalized, but one of the risks is loss of lung function over time when asthma is not optimally controlled. There also may be uh, people who have a type of asthma that may be more prone to that. There's some research going on into that. So I think having the, the testimony that you just had about the importance of lung function and the fact that, you know, with these asthma attacks, you may have lost some lung function, I think is, is probably more impactful than I and Dr. Lenore can say coming from a patient. Can I ask how you're doing now? Oh, I'm doing great. I'm, you know, I'm, oh, good, I'm good. exercising. <laughs> I'm, you know, but I mean, I do, I, I know that I have permanent damage because right. whenever I, whenever I go up a hill or go up a, a bunch of flights of stairs or whatever, I'm, I'm always out of breath. And, and, uh, so I can, I can tell, and I, but I, I do get, um, my, my lung function increased, um, just marginally, um, mm -hmm. uh, because of, because I was, because I lost weight and because I got exercise. Mm -hmm. And I'm mm -hmm. doing exercise mm -hmm. regularly. And I always take my yeah. medications. I will never not, I will never stop taking right. those. Right. <laughs> you know, as I told one of the other, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. I said, as I suggested to the earlier caller, uh, you might want to talk to your pulmonologist or primary care if there, and I don't know your case enough to say for sure, but if there would be any utility or benefit of you getting in maybe four to six weeks of a pulmonary rehab program, as many hospitals now offer on an outpatient basis. I, like I said, I told you the anecdote about my mom, and I, I was just blown away. I was, I was totally clueless about that as an active intervention. And there are protocols, particularly in the adult world, that really do increase your ability to exercise, your tolerance, sometimes not necessarily with changing your lung function, just kind of training you up a little bit better. So I would just beg that question because you might have more improvement in front of you. Uh -huh. all, right. Thank you. All, right. all right, thank you very much for sharing with us. Let's now go to Julia and San Mateo. You're on About Health. Hi. Hi. But thank you so much for the program and especially for your compassionate, socially aware, um, you know, uh, comments about the effects of poverty and stuff. I have a very brief question. I'll take the answer off the air. Um, I have a very minor COPD, which is under control. I live in a smoke-free building. About 60 feet from my apartment, there is a smoker. And I wonder, is it just being alarmist to worry about secondhand smoke from that kind of distance? He does keep his doors closed, but when the door is opened, I can smell the smoke, and I don't understand whether this is something I should turn him in for. Thank you very much. Well... Yeah, excellent question. So if it truly is a smoke-free uh, environment and you can still smell cigarette smoke, I think you should let the uh, the landlord know that. 
And yes, passive smoking, even though you're not smoking, if you can smell that, that does have the potential to cause problems for you given your underlying condition. So I, I think that is something not just for your benefit, but for the other tenants you'd be responsible to share. If indeed this is a smoke-free environment and he is violating that, he is, he is putting you at risk. Oh, I agree. All right, let's go to Berkeley and talk to Ellen. You're on About Health. Hi, good day. Thank you so much for this program on asthma. Um, quick question about African-American boys between the ages of 7 and 10. I understand that from the literature there is an epidemic of asthma among that age group. One, because they tend to drink less water and drink more of the sugary sodas that they see um older men drinking out of aluminum cans because they think drinking out of an aluminum can means that you're, you know, more manly. And as a result, they tend to consume, not alcohol, of course, because they're too young, but they consume things that are not in their best interest health-wise and that that particular uh, consumption has reduced their water consumption, which is adding a risk factor to asthma, and I wanted to know if that's still a situation that's true. Well, the first off, uh, just as a public health issue, what you said is absolutely true. We do know that asthma rates under puberty or before puberty are highest in African-American males mm -hmm. and do appear in some cases to be increasing, so you're absolutely spot on correct there. Um, the whole issue of I can't talk about the sugar, outside of the obvious nutritional detriment, the sugar drinks, but clearly one of the things I tell a lot of my patients, almost all my patients, is to hydrate, particularly in environments uh, where patients can get dehydrated, even marginally so. For temperature, I tell them it's, it's good to drink water if you're active and you're outside. Uh, we know for a fact, uh, maybe not causing asthma, but basically being marginally hydrated, your secretions will be thicker, they'll be harder to clear, they'll add to more airway obstruction. Um, I don't know that I can wrap my head scientifically why this is uh, a likely reason for the epidemic of asthma in African-American males, but I can tell you that uh, not drinking sufficient amounts of water certainly is problematic for many asthmatics. All right, well, thank you very much for that. Uh, you know, in the, just a couple of minutes we have remaining, Dr. Graham, what are you excited about as an asthma specialist uh, moving forward? Um, are we on the precipice of something uh, uh, really dynamic in terms of turning asthma around? Uh, yeah, I am excited. I'm excited about some of these new therapies. I think for the patients, and Mike, you and I both have patients like this, where we've gotten the patient to do everything, we've done everything, we've thrown all the right medicines at them, and we just still haven't gotten it. And that population may be genetically different or biochemically different. There may be different processes. And what's happening now with some of the research is very, very specific therapies that, if you identify the right person, could be life-changing. And you mentioned some of these with the selective calcium channel blockers and things like this and other medications, the biologics were developing antibodies to certain, um, which for the, for the listener, blocks the activity of certain chemicals in the body and so forth. I think this is really exciting. The cautionary note that I have is I just wonder if the poor patient, okay, the disenfranchised patient is going to get the attention and the characterization to find out if they need and, the drug. And that's exa exactly the point that we've been trying to make. Well, Dr. Yeah, Graham, exactly. thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Mike. days about health. Uh, coming up uh, next week, we uh, everybody's got a friend. Oprah's got a friend. Somebody, i got a friend, Shane, who knows about bone, bone and joints. He'll be with us uh, next week. And coming up in August, we'll have um, Dr. Mario Martinez joining us along with a, a whole host of other than thanks to Dr. Uh, Nurse Rona Renner for the great program she's producing for us. Uh, but remember, uh, thanks also. I had to thank Kevin and Felix and Josh. Uh, remember, health is your biggest asset. I'm Dr. Michael Knorr. We'll talk again next week. Grammy Award-winning Pacific Mambo Orchestra will be playing at the Seahorse Restaurant in Sausalito on Sunday, August 9th from 5 to 9 p.m. in a benefit for the family of our beloved KPFA broadcaster, Wesley Burton, who left this world too soon in a hit-and-run accident this spring. The Pacific Mambo Orchestra is an authentic 18-piece live band made up of some of the best musicians in the Bay Area. 
Join the KPFA family and friends in a night to honor Wesley and to continue to support his lovely family. It's a benefit for the family of Wesley Burton with Pacific Mambo Orchestra, Sunday, August 9th from 5 to 9 p.m. at the Sausalito Seahorse, 305 Harbor Way in Sausalito. For more information, go to SausalitoSeahorse.com. Why should the black man in America uh, concern himself since we've been away from the African continent for 400 years, three or 400 years? Why should we concern ourselves? What impact does what happened to them have upon us? Number one. For news, information, and analysis about Africa and the African diaspora, tune in weekly on Mondays at 7 p.m. to Africa Today with your host, Walter Turner. Africa Today is your source for being up to date on Africa and African. Mondays at 7 p.m., Africa Today on your Pacifica radio station, KPFA 94.1 FM. These are your listener-sponsored stations for Northern Central California and the world, KPFA Berkeley 94.1, KPFA.